All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. <clears throat> uh, today is Wednesday, April 10th, 2 p.m. section. Class is being recorded. Uh, here's the sign in sheet. By the way, did anybody notice that uh, NVIDIA is down like 10% since we, since we did our as is valuation? Uh, but, anyways. So today, uh, what we're going to spend most of our time on is lecture four, which is we're going to do the fourth section of the class on multiple analysis. Okay, so if you go to the files folder in lecture notes, uh, you might want to grab the lecture note four. Okay, so the other thing while you're doing that is <clears throat> a couple of uh, upcoming logistics. So Monday is going to be homework 10, or homework 11, next homework. Uh, it's going to be a, another valuation, and the company's going to be Boeing. Okay, so again, as is bull, bear, target, DES, EEO, wax, screenshots, paper, which includes the uh, sanity check that we did in the last class on your bull and your bear. Okay, that's an and. That's going to be part of this assignment. And I'll just let you know that Boeing will likely be a more difficult and challenging valuation than Costco. Right. I had chosen Costco intentionally because the future looks a lot like the present, okay? But that's not the case with Boeing, right? Boeing is obviously having lots of challenges, quality problems, et cetera, 737 MAX issues. Uh, recently, the 787 has now come under scrutiny. So just all sorts of issues with Boeing, right? That could make the valuation a little bit more challenging, right? Just give you a heads up on this one. In addition, the reason valuations can be more challenging, and I'll go back to our as is of Costco, is that as we talked about earlier, if you go to the DCF valuation tab, and this is true for just about any company, if you look at the operating value of the firm, which is most of the value of the company, most of that operating value comes in continuing value, which is year six into perpetuity. Okay, that's again true for any company. So getting the perpetuity right is the most important part of the valuation. Now that's the key value driver's equation. Four numbers lead to that 289.6 billion of continuing value. So getting those perpetuity numbers is really important. So back to what drives the perpetuity numbers. On the ratios, that's column M. Okay, that, that's the year that we go into perpetuity arbitrarily, year six. All right. So getting those year six values is really important. Now the thing about Costco is I think that year six is representative of their future, okay? But if another company, their year six, we just arbitrarily go into perpetuity, is not representative of the long-term future, then that could cause a little challenge with your valuation, okay? Because what we're doing is we're using those year six values to populate these four assumptions, which those four assumptions are driving the continuing value. Okay, so that's the year six, essentially, ROIC. If the year six ROIC is not representative of the future, then what you're going to have to do is in the assumptions, not in the ratios, plug in representative numbers of the future. Okay, so I'm just saying, we just arbitrarily stop in year six and say year six is representative. If year six is not representative, that's a problem. So for example, let's say you're dealing with a company that has a negative spread and they get to year six and they haven't really gotten to much of a spread and they get a lot of value. Well, the market's clearly not going to value them with negative spread long term if they have a lot of value. Okay, So at some point, the market's assuming they're going to turn the spread positive. So you might have to put in a different ROIC than the year six ROIC to finish your valuation. That's not only going to apply to DCF, it could apply to the multiples that we're about to do. Okay, So I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Not saying it's going to be the case for Boeing. But it could. It could also be the case for some of your group project companies, okay? Because not all the group project companies currently today have positive spreads, and if they have high values, then there's an assumption they might eventually turn it around, right? And what you can't do is you can't just plug and chug, because if you have a negative spread and a high value, and you solve and you get like a negative G of negative 20%, I'm telling you, you can't explain that logically in the classroom, okay? So if you get a company, I'll make it up, like BMW, and their valuation has a giant negative G, I don't think that's what the market's actually valuing that. They're not expecting BMW to shrink over time. Right? They're expecting them to grow over time. Now, can a negative G be possible? Sure. 
if a company's peaked and their performance in the future is worse than today, they could have a slightly negative G, but that's like negative 1%. It shouldn't be like, if you do negative 20%, they're losing 20% of their value a year. They're not gone in five years. Nobody expects that of a company, uh, of a company like a BMW, for example. So just be careful when you're doing these analysis that you can't just plug and chuck. So just heads up. And if you struggle with any of this, TAs are, valid. TAs are available the next few days. Take advantage of that. They're office hours. <clears throat> whether it's the group project or whether it's Boeing. <coughs> All right, let's talk about multiples, also known as comparables or comparables. So, <coughs> excuse me, the idea of a multiple analysis is what we're going to do is we're going to value companies based on things of similar price, right? And just to give you an example of this, in the real world, as an individual, the one you're probably most likely to run into it is if you ever buy or sell a house. Because to buy or sell a house, you're going to have to get an appraisal. And an appraisal is a multiples analysis. So what they're going to do is, for the appraisal, is they're going to look at all the houses that have sold, let's say, in your area in the last six months. They're going to look at all the prices. And they're going to look at the square foot of every one of those houses. They're going to take the price divided by the square foot. They're going to get a price per square foot. They're going to average it out. So say the average price is 600000 The average square feet is 2000 600000 divided by 2000 $300 per square foot. Okay, that's the average price per square foot. Then they'll say, how many square feet does your house times 300 That's the starting point for the appraisal. Okay, And then what the appraiser is going to do is going to adjust it up or down a little bit. They're going to say, well, the average house there had four bedrooms. You only have three bedrooms. So maybe we'll adjust it down a little bit. Or you don't have the same size lot as some of the other houses. Or maybe your location isn't as good. Or maybe you have a very old house and most of the ones were newer construction. So it'll make some adjustments up or down, but essentially it's kind of based on what other things of similar things have sold. Well, that's what we do with companies, okay? Except the adjustments are the key value drivers, right? So do they have a different growth? Do they have a different return? But essentially we look at real world prices to approximate what things of similar value should be trading at, right? Now the advantage of a multiple analysis, two, it, they're easy, because <laughs> you can actually see the prices, right? When you do a DCF, it's kind of theoretical. I put in values that lead to a price, okay? With a multiple analysis, you actually see the prices. Matter of fact, the analysis is I know the price, I gotta work backwards to figure out what the assumptions were, right? But nonetheless, <clears throat> uh, that's one of the advantages. The other advantage is it's easier. It's much easier to do a multiples than a DCF, right? The problem is it's because it's easy. It kind of oversimplifies things. We've got to be very careful about some of that oversimplification. But they are useful for valuing private companies. So, for example, if I have a private company, I can say, what would this company trade for if it were public? Well, based on these similar things, it should trade for this. Or it's good for mergers and acquisitions, also known as precedent transactions. What should I pay for something? Well, how much have people previously paid for similar things? We could actually see that. Matter of fact, in Bloomberg, you have another feature, if you haven't played with it, a precedent transaction database. MA, mergers and acquisitions, is pretty much every recent merger and acquisition. Here's a database of 14,388 recent mergers and acquisitions. Matter of fact, today is April 10th. You can see today an acquisition. You can look up a company, see every deal they've done. It's very, very powerful. But here is an Italian gas company that was acquired for $5.4 billion in cash. So I click on this, and I get all the information about the deal, but down here there's something called deal comps. These are multiples. So what they'll do is they'll say, okay, these are previous deals in recent years, it actually goes back a few years, <coughs> of people buying gas companies. Right? Here's how much they paid. Now the multiples haven't filled in. They announced it this morning. But basically... Here is the enterprise value, total value of the EBITDA. Here's the enterprise value of the EBIT. Here's the enterprise value of revenue. So for example, the average oil and gas company, people paid 8.65 times EBITDA, 12.18 times EBIT, and 2.3 times revenue. Okay? And that's the idea of a multiple analysis. That's a starting point if I'm starting to think about a deal. What should I be paying for something? Obviously, I can make adjustments. But <clears throat> again, this is called precedent transactions. <clears throat> the biggest challenge in multiples is finding 
similar companies, right? Because I'm going to compare you. That's why it's also called a comparable analysis. I want to compare against similar things. And it sounds simple, but let's talk about this. If I'm doing Costco, right, comparing them against Walmart, Walmart Target, okay, they, they're kind of selling very similar things. If I'm doing Disney, well, it gets a little more complicated, right? Who do I compare Disney against? Do I compare them against theme parks? Well, if I compare them against theme parks, I'm going to compare them against Universal Studios, which, by the way, is owned by Comcast, which owns a giant cable business. And it's buried in there, right? If I compare Disney for the streaming services, I'm going to compare them against Netflix and Paramount and some of the other companies. And if I compare them against their cruise ship business, which Disney has, I can compare them against Royal Caribbean or Carnival and some of the others. But see how complicated this is getting? Because that one company, like, I can't compare Royal Caribbean against Comcast. That doesn't make any sense. Yet they're comparable to Disney. And so finding true comparables is, is simple in theory, but in the real world, it gets harder and harder to do, okay? But nonetheless, we still have to do it. So therefore, we will do comparables against you know, square pegs and round holes. We're doing a lot of that. But nonetheless, that's actually one of the important parts of a multiple analysis. The other part is that the comparables actually don't give you a direct answer, they give you a range. And we'll talk more about that in a little while. So again, the challenges with multiples is that they're easy, and therefore we're kind of oversimplifying things. And so the ideal part is that when you do comparables, you want companies with similar growth and returns, right? So for example, if I'm doing Facebook, I don't want to compare Facebook against an early stage social media startup because they're not really that comparable. They're, they're going to have different multiples, okay? And, and I should recognize that. So I have a very fast growing company and a very slow growing mature company. That's not as comparable. So ideally, I want to compare things that have similar growth and similar returns. That's the ideal comparison when I do multiple analysis. The steps are pretty straightforward. Best practices coming out of our book. Okay? First, and, and actually most challenging, find the list of companies that you're going to compare against. That's step one. Okay? Step two, go get your data. We're going to use Bloomberg to get the data. Step three, calculate the multiples. Bloomberg is going to calculate the multiples for us. Step four, <coughs> benchmark. Compare the multiples across companies, try and explain the differences, and <coughs> understand what's driving those multiples. Okay? That's basically a very straightforward process for the analysis that we're about to do. Best practices. Already talked about one. Choose truly comparable companies based on similar growth, similar ROIC prospects. That's a better list of comparables. Two, use forward-looking data. Okay? Companies are worth their future cash flows. They're not worth their historical cash flows. That's why we're using forward multiples, not historical multiples. Third, enterprise value multiples tend to be preferred against price-to-earnings multiples. Right? PE, price-to-earnings, is pretty common but it's actually the hardest multiple to explain. Because to explain differences in PE, you have to explain the E, the earnings, right? Which means across the companies. So you gotta talk about the differences in cost of goods sold, the difference in SG&A, the difference in depreciation, the difference in interest and capital structure, the difference in tax rates, and one times gains or losses. PE is a six factor analysis, whether people realize it or not. So PEs are real simple until you try to explain them because there's a lot of things that go into a PE, right? Enterprise value, EV, to EBIT, for example, I'm not saying it's not easier, but here's the point. EV to EBIT kind of stops at EBIT, which means it doesn't have as much impact on tax rate. It doesn't have as much difference on capital structure. It doesn't have as much difference on one-time gains and losses. So they tend to be a little bit more normalized across the operations of the firm. So we prefer enterprise to EBIT and EBITDA, but we're still going to do both. We'll do PE and EV to EBIT. In the real world, an industry will kind of settle on a multiple. Airlines might be PE. Banks might be PE. Chemical companies might be EV to EBITDA. Okay? So it's kind of like a key multiple in an industry. But nonetheless, in this class, um, we will talk about four. And finally, adjust. Meaning, take a company like Apple, which has over $100 billion of cash on hand. Another tech company doesn't have all the cash on hand. 
the 100 billion dollars of cash on hand is going to affect our multiple. So it might distort it a little bit. So we've got to be careful about some of these non-operating adjustments. They can be used, as I said, for acquisitions, which are called precedent transactions. Basically, what's happened in the past is a way of uh, looking at what we might want to pay for the future. <coughs> but all multiples are based on the key value drivers. All right, and, and that's what we're, we're really going to start the analysis here in this class. So as a reminder, skip a couple slides ahead, this is the key value driver equation. Okay, we've been using it all semester, KVD. Okay. All multiples are based on the key value driver equation. Law of one price. If I change my method for value of the company, I still have to get the same answer. I can't get a different answer just because I did my same approach. Okay. So if I do key value drivers for DCF, I should use key value drivers for multiples. So how does this work? With that equation, I'm going to create a table. Okay. So what this table does is it says, okay, if I start with 100 million of NOPAT and a 10% WAC or cost of capital, and I plug that in the key value driver's equation, and I plug in G's of 1% to 5% and ROICs of 6 to 16%, these are the results. Just print it out in this table. Okay? So that's the result of those numbers run through the key value driver equation. So for example, if I have a 2% G, a 10% ROIC, a 10% cost of capital, and 100 of no plat or no pat, I get a thousand or a billion of value. Right in the table. That's just playing it out. Okay. By the way, why does this column, regardless of the G, one, two, three, four, five, at 10% ROIC, why does it stay at a thousand? Why does it not change? As the growth rate changes, why is the value not changing? And there's no difference in the RIC and the WAC or the cost of capital, zero spread, and so therefore no value. We talked about it earlier this semester, right? So that's why that column is not changing as the growth changes. But that's important because if you look to the left of that, any ROIC less than 10%, the more you grow, the more value that's being destroyed. And to the right of that, ROIC is greater than 10%, the more you grow, the more value that's being created. Growth positive spread, growth negative spread. Those are the scenarios we talked about Early semester, I'm just showing you some numbers. Everybody with me so far? All right, so here's how this turns into a multiple. So taking that table on the previous slide, moving it to this slide, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an EV to EBIT multiple. <clears throat> okay? So at 100 million of NOPAT, and assume a 35% tax rate, okay, take 100 divided by 0.65, and you get 154 of EBIT. Okay, so that would what the, the EBIT have to be. So how do I get an EV to EBIT? 1,000 divided by 154 is six and a half times EBIT. That's that whole column. Okay, so if a company has 10% ROIC, 2% growth, it would trade an EV to EBIT of 6.5. Does everybody see how those numbers are created? All right. If they had an 8%, ROIC and a 4% growth, they trade at 5.4 times EBIT because it would be 833 divided by the 154. Okay, so here's the analysis. <clears throat> Let's say in this industry, we find a company <clears throat> that is trading at six times EBIT. What can we infer? What can we infer about the key value drivers, their growth in ROIC, if they were trading at six times EBIT. Anybody have an answer for that one? Yep. They have the growth rate of ROIC of 6%. Or could, could they could have a 2% growth rate and ROIC close to 8%? But either case, did they have a positive or negative spread? So what we can infer is that the company likely has a negative spread because we don't see any six times EBIT that has a positive spread. So they likely have a negative spread. But this is what I mean by range of outcomes. Like it could be one six, it could be two eight, 
there's a, there's a combinations of growth in ROICs that can lead to a six. So it's a range. But I know that that entire range is a negative spread. On the converse side, let's say we have a company that's trading at seven times even. Well, if you look, where are the sevens? Okay, here's a seven, here's a seven, somewhere in here's a seven. Somewhere in this range of 12 to 16 percent ROICs at one to three percent growths, that's what I would say is a seven times even. But the whole point is, it would be suggestive of a positive spread. So if I saw a company trading at seven times EBIT, they'd be low growth, hot positive spread. If I saw a company trade at six and a half times EBIT, they'd probably be low growth negative spread. But that is something I can infer from the multiples and the key value drivers. Yes, sir. For the Boeing uh, homework, do we hmm. use the VIX or the You have to decide. One of the two. All right. <clears throat> Everybody got that on the spread? Questions about that? All right, so two things. Range of outcomes is, is one of the two things I wanted to mention here. All right, doesn't give you an exact answer, kind of gives you a range right, of outcomes. And the other thing is it's based on the key value drivers. And I'll say it even more specifically. Multiples are just an expression of growth and spread. That's all they are. They're future growth and spreads. That's a multiple, okay? Matter of fact, <clears throat> I was telling the previous classes, here's the most idiotic thing you'll see on CNBC today from a bunch of billionaires, right? They'll say, Costco has a PE of 30, making a number up. Walmart has a PE of 20. You should buy Walmart because it's on sale, okay? Because its PE is lower. It's trading at a discount, it's a bargain. So buy Walmart. No, what we're gonna learn is the reason why Walmart does not have the PE of Costco is Walmart doesn't have the growth of Costco and doesn't have the expected return of Costco. And that's why they're trading at a discount. And unless Walmart increases its growth or it increases its return, it's not gonna trade at the PE that Costco is trading at at 30, right? Companies just don't go up arbitrarily. They go up because their performance is expected to improve. They go down because their performance is expected to worsen. So what you learned in your previous finance classes is kind of like a very simplistic approach. You know, everybody eventually trades for the average of the industry. No, you don't trade for the average of your industry <clears throat> unless you have an average growth spread combination. If you don't have an average growth spread combination, you're not going to be average. You're going to be above or below. <clears throat> and you want to improve? Change your growth spread. So a lot of our analysis is going to be understanding the growth and spread of the key value drivers that lead to the multiples. Multiple number two, price to earnings multiple. It's also based on key value drivers. On the right side of the slide is the key value driver equation. Here's what we're going to do. We're, because price to earnings is based on earnings per share, which is net income, we're going to take the exact same equation and we're going to plug in equity values. So no pat becomes net income. G becomes growth in the net income. ROIC becomes return on the equity, the return on the shareholder's money, the net income. And the discount rate is the cost of the equity, not the WAC. Okay? So same equation, just equity values. So here's how we would do a PE. If we took that equation with equity values, right here, create a table. Starting with 100 million of net income, 10% cost of equity, at these return on equities, 6 to 16%, and these growth in equities, 1 to 5%, these would be the values. So a 100 million of income, 10% cost of equity at a 10% ROE, and a 2% growth, that's worth a thousand or a billion. Okay? And so what's the PE? A thousand divided by 100, price divided by earnings. A company with a zero spread in this industry would trade at a PE of 10. A company with a negative spread in this industry would trade at a PE below 10, and a company with a positive spread in this industry would trade at a PE above 10. Very similar concept for price to earnings. All multiples are just key value drivers rearranged.
So again, why are we using <clears throat> and prefer EV to EBIT, not price to earnings? Short version is price to earnings multiples tend to be really influenced by capital structure, right? And so therefore, they are harder to explain and can be a little bit more distorted based on the amount of debt. Enterprise value to EBIT multiples, not as much. I think they'll have some influence, but not nearly as much. So they tend to be more normalized across the operations of firms, okay? But it also is the case that if you're doing with an earlier stage company, you can't do an EV to EBIT because they might not have any EBIT, right? So you might have to do a different multiple, but nonetheless, for more mature companies, we like EV to EBIT or EV to EBITDA. <clears throat> so if we like EV to EBIT, how do you calculate an EV to EBIT? This is the derivation of the formula to estimate an EV to EBIT directly. We start with the key value drivers, okay? And we say, okay, no PAT is EBIT times one minus the tax rate. Divide both sides by EBIT, EV to EBIT, can't, EBIT cancels out, one minus the tax rate times one minus the growth of our ROIC divided by WAC minus G. So the point is, the formula at the bottom is a key value driver formula, rearranged, and that's how you could directly estimate an EV to EBIT multiple. On the previous slide, key value driver rearranged and replugged in, that's how you directly estimate a PE. All multiples are based on the key value drivers. How do I do EV to revenue, also known as EV to sales? Start with key value drivers. To get to EV to revenue, revenue is revenue times EBIT margin. EBIT times one minus tax rate over revenue. Divide both sides by revenue. Revenue cancels out here. EV to revenue is the margin times one minus the tax rate times one minus G over ROIC divided by WAC minus G. That's the formula to directly calculate an EV to revenue multiple. And here's the final thing I want to show you. The EV to revenue multiple is your margin times all of that. All of that, one minus tax rate times one minus G over ROIC divided by WAC minus G, is the formula for EV to EBIT. That formula is that. So EV to revenue is your margin times your EV to EBIT multiple. If you take your EV to revenue and you divide by your EV to EBIT, you get your perpetuity margin. That's what I showed you three weeks ago and we've been using in our DCF. And that's the derivation, okay? Because I, I know it has to work because <clears throat> it's math. And all these equations are just rearranged math. Questions, comments, concerns about any of this so far? All right, well, since you guys all understand that, let's talk about the analysis. So the next file you need is if you go here and you want this file, which I loaded, called convert, uh, no, it's not this one. This file called multiples assignment in class. So you'll need that Excel file. It's off of Elms. I want to have that handy. That file is this file. Okay. So what it represents is for Costco, Walmart, and Target, three multiples, and an analysis of the three multiples that we did last semester. Okay. And I'm going to use that to show you the multiple analysis that you're going to have to do with a minimum 500 word paper to explain the differences in the multiples for the three companies, right? So we're going to do the analysis first. And after we do the analysis, I'm going to show you how to go get the data out of Bloomberg, okay? So let's assume we got the data out of Bloomberg. This is what you're going to end up analyzing. So there's two tabs. The first tab is called the PE or price to earnings multiple. We'll start there, okay? So as of spring, 20, or sorry, fall 2024, probably November-ish time frame, is when this data came in. These are the four data points that were plugged in for PE to this equation, which is in this cell, to equal a PE. And similar to the as is, 
we got the PE in the real world at the time. This is the four, second year forward PE for Costco. And we matched it with the key value driver's equation. These four things led to the 33.13 PE. Okay? Now, the way to analyze this is we're going to compare the PEs of Costco, Walmart, and Target. If a company's PE is higher than its peer, it's called trading at a premium. If a company's trading lower than its peer, it's called trading at a discount. Okay? So we're going to analyze Costco against Walmart and Costco against Target. At the time, Costco with a PE of 33.13 is trading at a premium to Walmart, which is a forward PE of 22.96. Why? Well, it's these values. What about those values makes the Costco PE higher? Right? First thing, we know that net income doesn't matter. Because if I made net income a dollar in the key value driver world, it doesn't affect the multiple. Okay? So what really matters are these three numbers. PEs are an expression of future growth, return, and risk. Growth spread. That's the point. That's what the key value drivers tell us. So what about the growth spread tells me that Costco is trading a premium. Why are they at 33? Start with spread. The spread of Costco is 21.5 versus 10.4. Okay? So we'll call that 11 points of spread. Right? Walmart, 21 minus 8.9, we'll call that 12 points of spread. Walmart actually has a higher spread than Costco, expected in the future. So that should actually be a higher PE. Okay? That's not why Costco is trading at a premium or Walmart's trading at a discount. But that's a factor, and I need to explain that. Second, it's how fast you're growing that spread. Okay? Walmart is growing that 12-point spread at 5.7% a year. Costco is growing their 11-point spread at 8.59% a year. That's why I'm paying a premium for Costco. It's the much higher expected growth. All right? So slightly lower spread, but huge growth, that's the whole point. Because if I took 21 and a half cents, and I grew that at 8.6% a year, and I took 21 cents, and I grew that at 5.7% a year, Costco's gonna be a lot more valuable. That's why I'm paying a more premium for Costco, and that's why they have a higher multiple. Does everybody see that? Those are two important factors. Then, and this is why this class gets a little bit more advanced, there's a third factor that is often overlooked. And that is the cost of equity, the risk. If we discount a dollar at 10.4%, and we discount a dollar at 8.9%, which is worth more? Is it worth more to discount something at 10.4% or is it worth more to discount something at 8.9%? Exactly. Discount rates affect multiples. And people forget about that when they do the analysis. So Costco has a higher risk, higher discount rate. 10.4% cost of equity, Walmart 8.9. That is hurting the multiple of Costco and helping the multiple of Walmart. Now, it's not enough to offset the much higher growth rate of Costco, but it does play as to what the multiples are going to be. I'll give you an example. If Walmart's had the same risk as Costco, if this 8.9% cost of equity, it's 10.4, their PE would be 15.58. It wouldn't be 23. So Walmart is benefiting by the lower perceived risk. I'll say it a different way. If Costco had the same discount rate as Walmart and their cost of equity was 8.9%, their PE would be 192. But it's not because they're perceived to be higher risk. So there's three things at work. There's the expected growth, there's the expected spread, and then there's the hurdle rate. Those are the three things that you have to talk about when you're explaining a PE. Why is Costco trading at a premium to Target? Target has the highest spread of the three. The 30% ROE against an 11.2% cost of equity, that's almost nine, uh, sorry, just say 19 points of spread. The problem is they have the lowest growth. High spread but lowest growth at 4.3%, and it's half the growth of Costco of 8.59, which again is going to be compounded. 
So the reason Target is trading at a discount to Costco and to Walmart is they lack the growth. They're making a lot of money, great returns. They're just not expected to grow as fast. And that is why they're trading at a discount, 12.4 versus 33.13. Everybody see that? The other thing that's hurting Target is they have the highest cost of equity amongst the three, which means those cash flows are discounted at the highest rate and they have the highest risk. So Costco, two big factors, half the growth of Costco and higher cost of equity than Costco, that's why they're trading at a discount. This is fairly straightforward in terms of the companies I gave you, but does everybody see how we're connecting those dots? Because this is probably 250 of the words you're writing in your paper assignment. Connecting the dots with the data that you gather. Everybody kosher so far? Okay, nay? Okay, now's a good time to ask. All right, <clears throat> let's talk about multiple number two, enterprise value to EBIT, okay? So again, down here was the enterprise value to EBIT on the same day, last fall, for the three companies. In this cell is the formula for EV to EBIT. So again, going back to the formulas, this is the formula for EV to EBIT. That formula is in this cell. And that formula has four factors. So these factors lead to this result. Again, like an as is, we match the formula result with the real world, and then we explain. Same concept. If the EV to EBIT's trading at higher value than its peers, it's trading at a premium. Lower discount, start with Costco against Walmart. Costco with a 24.77 forward EV to EBIT. Trading at a premium to Walmart, Walmart 17.33. Why? Well, let's get one off the table. Tax rate. These tax rates are pretty similar. 26, 26 and a half. I don't think the slight difference in tax rate is going to make much of a difference. Matter of fact, I could do it. If Walmart had the same 26% tax rate as Costco, 17.45 versus 17.33. It's not making much of a difference. Does it make any difference? Yes. Hurts Walmart a little bit, but that's not the primary reason for Costco's premium. Second, spread. On an operating basis, where we're not looking at capital structure, Costco has a higher spread than Walmart. Remember, on a PE, where we are looking at capital structure, think debt, Costco, ROE, spread, not much difference. Operating, much bigger difference. But the point is, on an operating basis, Costco has a much higher spread than Walmart. 26.46 minus 10.2, that is about a 16.2% spread. Walmart, 17.85 minus 8.2, that's about a 9-point spread. Okay? So Costco is substantially higher spread. And Costco, much higher growth. Expected 8% versus Walmart's 5%. So clearly, why is Costco trading at a premium? for an EV to EBIT, much higher growth, much higher spread, similar tax rate. It is being somewhat hindered and offset by Costco's higher risk. 10.2% WAC versus 8.2% WAC. So that's a headwind for Costco. Like I said, their, their EV to EBIT would be even higher if they had Walmart's risk, change this to 8.2, you would see their EV to EBIT would be 700. Share price would be off the charts, okay? But the, the point of the story is, that is actually benefiting Walmart, but not enough to offset the lower growth, lower spread. <clears throat> Why is Costco trading at a premium to Target? Well, Target has the lowest growth at 4.65% on an operating basis. Target has a lower spread than Costco, 21 minus 9.7. Now, Costco, sorry, Target does have the better tax rate than Costco, 22 versus 26, but it's that lack of growth at slightly lower spread that leads to the discount. Okay. And again, target benefits in this scenario on a WAC basis, <laughs> slightly lower risk than Costco. Interestingly, on a cost of equity basis, target higher risk than Costco, which suggests that target actually uses more debt in their capital structure. 
Multiple number three, EV to sales, also known as EV to revenue. Point nine, what do all these multiples mean, right? EV to not, point nine means if Costco sells a dollar, that adds 90 cents to their stock price, right, to their value, the value of the company, right? If <coughs> Walmart sells a dollar, it adds 75 cents to the value of the company. And if Target sells a dollar, it adds 64 cents of value to the company. So when Costco sells things, they make more value. They create more value, right? And we know that is because of this formula. This is the formula for EV to revenue, right? It's so the margin times EV to EBIT. So EV to revenue is very much associated with margin, okay? Generally, if you make more money, you should generate more value. Meaning, if I have a 20% margin and I'm making 20 cents every time I sell something, and somebody else has a 10% margin, and they make 10 cents every time they sell something, when they sell something, they're just not gonna be as valuable. They don't make the margin that I do, okay? That's why EV to revenue is very much margin driven. But that formula shows margin's not the only thing that drives it. It's margin times EV to EBIT. And EV to EBIT includes tax rate, growth, and ROIC. So again, it's all the key value drivers actually affect this. Margin just kind of stands out front. So when I'm trying to explain this, Costco, EV to sales, EV to revenue, 0.9 versus 0.75, trading a premium to Walmart. Here's what's interesting. Walmart has a higher margin. Their operating margin is 4.3%. Costco 3.6. Their after-tax margin, 3.2, higher than Costco's 2.7. So Walmart's making more money. Why am I paying less for their sales? And the answer is productivity. Walmart spends almost twice as much of investment to drive those sales. And the return they get on those sales is 18% versus 26% at Costco, because Costco is more efficient. So the reason why people pay more for EV to sales at Costco is because of the productivity or efficiency of their warehouse. That's their secret sauce. It's not the margins, right? They're actually the lowest margins of the three companies. What's happening with Target? Target is trading at a discount to Costco as well. EV to sales at Target is 64 cents. EV to sales at Costco is 90 cents. Ironically, Target has the highest margins of the three. 5.3% pre-tax, 4.2% after-tax. So why are they trading at a discount for EV to revenue? And the answer is because of the productivity. Target spends twice as much, 20 cents versus 10 cents, as Costco to drive sales. And they have a lower return, 21 cents versus 26.4 cents on those sales. And that's why the EV to revenue is not as valuable. Does everybody see that? Now, it gets a little bit more complicated when you compare Walmart in the mix, okay? Because Walmart has a lower margin than Target, and Walmart has similar bad productivity to Target, 18 and 20, not too much difference. But really, what matters for EV to revenue at Walmart is that 8.2% whack. The low whack at Walmart gives their sales more valuable. They don't make as much margin, but every dollar is not discounted as much and is more valuable. For Target versus Costco, Costco actually has a higher whack, so it's the productivity that matters more to the discount. Okay? It's the 20 cents versus the 10 cents. Right? But nonetheless, this is the other few hundred words that you would have written in your minimum paper for the three companies. So for your next homework assignment, I'm gonna give you three companies, not these three, and you're gonna to have to write up and do the analysis. This one is straightforward. Okay. The one after that will not be straightforward, okay? I'll pick an industry like Boeing that's a little bit more difficult, right? But nonetheless, this is what you're gonna have to do for not this Monday, but the following Monday. All right, how do you get the data? Data's gonna come from Bloomberg. So let's update this to today. And we'll do Costco and Walmart. Just in our update. So we'll use Bloomberg to get the data. So I'll start out with Costco. All right, first screenshot I'll do is I'll do the WAC. Similar to your DCF. Two numbers. Here is Costco's current WAC. 
Here's Costco's current cost of equity. 9698, take a screenshot. You'll have to submit that. So we'll do a DCF. So come in here. 9698. So Costco WAC today 9.6. And 9.8. Matter of fact, let's do this. See, it's more clear about what we're about to update. We don't get confused. A lot of numbers on the screen. All right. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> what am I going to do? Costco, WAC, 9.6. And cost of equity, 9.8. Second screenshot to get your data. More data is going to come on this one, the EEO. All right, we are going to use second forward year. Okay. In our DCF, we use FY2, FY3. We're going to do multiples based on FY2. But, asterisk, if FY2 is screwed up, then we're going to go to FY3. Right? So, for example, let's say you're doing Boeing, and Boeing's going to take a couple of years before they fix themselves. I don't know if in the second year they're going to be completely fixed. So if we do their multiples in the second forward year, we may not get a realistic per perpetuity number for Boeing. Okay? It's going to take them more than two years to fix. So I'm just saying, Costco, Walmart, they're not broken. All right? They're kind of like a clock. They're pretty predictable. Past looks like the future. Not worried about it. This is why you got to use your thinking cap sometimes when you do these analysis. Right? But back to this, second forward year is where we're going to start. Second forward year net income, take a screenshot. For Costco today, 77.48. So I come in here, 77.48. Okay. While I'm on the screen, PE right here, second forward year, count columns, 1, 2, 41.26. So today, Costco's PE was. Six months ago, it was 33. Now it's 41, 41.26. All right. Return in equity. If you scroll down in the EEO, here's a forecast for the next four years of return in equity for Costco. Last year, 27.5%, 29% this year, 29% next year. 27% two years from now, 25% three years from now. I need a perpetuity. But somewhere mid-20s is probably where they're going to be in the future. I think the market probably expects Costco to continue that. Okay, So I'm going to use 25 or 26. Okay, a little judgment here, but I might even say give them 26. I'll give them credit right, for the performance. So 26%. By the way, tools, goal seek. I want to set the formula for the PE, B9, to 41.26 by solving for a G, which is B3. And that's going to get me a G of around 8%, 8.13%. There's Costco today out of PE. Okay, so we're doing the same thing for Walmart. Okay, so for Walmart, I'm going to go to their EEO. Okay, their second forward year net income, twenty-seven two three. While I'm on the screen, their PE in the second forward year, 23.3 today. Still trading at a big discount to Costco. It's a bigger discount. <clears throat> their expected ROE, let's kind of look at the next four years. 21, 22, 22, 21, 21, 22, somewhere in that range. Okay. So I'll, I could say 21, 21 and a half, 22, somewhere in that range, I'm probably good. I'm going to say 22. Okay. And finally, I need a cost of equity off their WAC screen. 
Today, cost of equity, 8.5, WAC, 7.9. Let's put them both in now. 8.5, and on the next screen, might as well put it in. This is eventually going to be 7.9. Right. And then finally, same thing. I'm going to solve for the G using goal seek tools. Goal seek. Put uh, my PE. Whoa. They don't have an 850% cost of equity. 8.5. There. Tools, goal seek. My PE, which is C9 to 23.3 by solving C3. And that's going to get me today's G around 5.2%. Right. So by the way, from an analysis standpoint, it's not too different than what I showed you with the data from the fall. Right? Because basically, Costco has a G of 8. Walmart, G is closer to 5. Walmart X is a lower spread than Costco. 22 minus 8.5 is lower than 26 minus 9.8. So Costco, with a high growth, high spread, is trading at a big premium. The reason why it's 33 P PE last semester and 41 this semester is because the cost of equity for Costco has come down to 9.8%, and it's actually made that spread more valuable. That's why the spread's higher. Everybody with me so far? All right, so let's do the enterprise value to EBIT multiples. <clears throat> so again, I need a tax rate. In Bloomberg, that is guidance or BRC. If there's no guidance, <clears throat> let's see if Walmart gives tax rate guidance. Scroll down a little, and they actually do 25 and a half, right? So again, they previously said 26 and a half. They've actually reduced it to 25 and a half in the future. So for Walmart tax rate, 25 and a half. For Costco, we just did it in the DCF, and I believe it still stays at 26. But nonetheless, let's go to Costco still stays at 26. All right, finally we need an ROIC so we can solve for our G. And we need the multiples, all right? Oh, I forgot to put the multiples in. So back on the EEO screen. At the bottom where we got the PE, we need the second forward year EV to sales, EV to revenue. 1.17 is today. And EV to EBIT is 31.77. For Walmart, Their EV to revenue is 0.78. And their EV to EBIT is 17 and a half. 17.5. So then I need my ROIC. Yes. What, uh, GUID, guidance, same as we did the DCFs. And if it's non-guidance, we're going to go to BRC and we'll use the J.P. Morgan tax rate estimate. I'm sorry? For the, the multiples, you will. For the, because you're going to do more companies. For the DCF, everybody's doing the same company. You may not, you may be doing different companies for your multiples. So therefore, different screen shots. But it'll be in the, in the instructions for the assignment. Now this is the toughest part. We need an operating ROIC in perpetuity. Ideally, you do an enterprise DCF as is. Because if you did your as is, you have a pretty good idea what the operating ROIC should be. Right? 
if we're being lazy, I'm not going to make you do a DCF every time, then I'm going to show you the proxy way to do it. Okay? Start with this. Go to RV. And open up your spread template that has operating ROIC. Now, I'm on Walmart. which already has uh, Costco and Target on theirs. I could have gone the Target one, because they're basically, I just need all three. And then the, the template that I needed was my Opera OIC and my WAC. Well, I don't really need the WAC on mine, but you would have your, your template saved. Operating ROIC is the important one. Walmart last year had an operating ROIC of 13%. The question is, what's the perpetuity ROIC? Right? Now, here's the thing. When we looked at, and I'll go back to the EEO here. When we looked at the expected returns in equity, Bloomberg doesn't directly calculate a forward ROIC. They just don't. They do a forward ROE from the analyst, but they don't do a forward ROIC. Wish they did. But here's the point. ROIC and ROE should be related, right? Because you take your ROIC and you multiply your, by your debt to equity ratio, you get your ROIC, right? So basically, just cap structure is the only difference between ROIC and ROE. So here's the point. If Walmart's ROE is expected to stay pretty stable, maybe even go up a little bit, then it's a good bet that Walmart's ROIC is expected to stay stable. Okay, So the ROIC today should look a lot like the ROIC in the future, because the ROE today looks a lot like the ROE in the future. So therefore, I could use today's ROIC for Walmart. Everybody with me? So for Walmart, if I'm cheating, their ROIC today is Operating ROIC today is around 13.19. I'm, I'm going to use either 13.19 or the ROE got a little bit better. I might even say 14. Because right, they got a point or two better of ROE, so I'll give them a point or two more of ROI. I think they're somewhat correlated. So I'm going to give Walmart a 14% ROIC into perpetuity. Does everybody see what I'm doing and why I'm doing it? All right. I'm going to do the same thing for Costco. So I'm going to look at Costco's ROE. And so the point about Costco is last year their ROE was 9, I'm oh sorry, 27, 28, 20, 29, 29, 27, 26. So it's around the same. So for Costco, I'm going to actually use a similar ROIC because their ROEs are pretty similar. So off of the, for this cell, last year their ROIC was about operating 26.46. So I think 26 is probably reasonable in the perpetuity for Costco as well because their ROEs are stable. right? Now let's say a company's ROE went from negative 10 to 0 to 5 to 15. I probably wouldn't do an average of the four. Like if they got to 15 and that was stable, I'd probably use 15 for their ROE. Okay? So you got to be careful about how these numbers work. But the idea is there should be a correlation between the return on equity and the ROIC. Okay? So if they're both stable, they, today probably does look like tomorrow. If it's improving, then the ROIC should improve as the ROE improves. If the ROE is going down, then the ROIC should go down because ROIC times your capital structure equals ROE. Okay? Everybody kind of generally follow that? So now that I've done this, I solve for my Gs. Okay? For Costco, if I goal seek, I'm going to set the EBIT, EV to EBIT multiple formula to the 31.77 by estimating a G 
which is B7, B5, and that's going to get me 7.99. By the way, in your as-is DCF model for Costco, what was your G? As-is DCF Costco. Do you remember? It was 8%. And in our multiples analysis, it's 8%. That's not a coincidence. That's what I mean. Just because you change your approach, these are just rearranged equations. You should still get very similar answers. The only difference is the stock price might have changed a little bit since last week, but it should still be around 8 and 7.99. So that's what I'm saying. Like, you should expect that. Right? That's why it's better to do a DCF to estimate the G and then use that G uh, than the multiples. But the multiples should still come up with the same answer. By the way, here for Walmart, tools goal seat. That to the 17.5 by solving for a G to C5, and that works out to 5.2. So if we do our analysis, we're going to see very similar things. Costco has a much higher spread than Walmart, 26 minus 9.6, much higher than 14 versus 7.9. Costco still is at 8% growth versus the 5% uh, growth at Walmart. But the reason why Costco, that's why the trade premium, but the reason why the premium is expanded, why today the EV to EBIT is higher, why today the PE is higher, is because the whack of the cost of equity for Costco have come down. A little bit less risk to their model in the way that they're being valued today. All right, questions about where the data's coming from, the screenshots that you would need, how to plug it in, or how to do the analysis. So let me pull this back up. This is Wednesday. Next two days, the TAs have office hours. If you're confused or struggle with any of this, please take advantage of that, okay? Monday, 10 a.m., your assignment is Boeing, valuation, as is bull bear target, DES, EEO, wax screenshots, including in the bull and the bear, the sanity checks with the multiples. Somebody asked about whether you use BIX or analyst curated, it's up to you. Okay, just make sure that you have reasonable multiples and enough companies to, to compare against to get a range for the industry, okay? Minimum 500 word paper explaining all that. Next Wednesday, one week from today, you are doing a 10-minute PowerPoint presentation. So you got to turn in your PowerPoint with all the screenshots plus um, the four Excel models, and you're going to be going through that presentation. And that's 10% of your semester grade. Same rules as the previous two. Okay. The following Monday, you're going to have three different companies. It won't be Costco, Walmart, and Target, but you're welcome to use this template. You've got to fill it in with their data. Get the screenshots, turn that in, plus a minimum 500 word paper explaining premiums or discounts, company one versus the other two, for PE, EV to EBIT, and EV to revenue, EV to sales. Okay, that's what's coming up. Monday, it's coming Monday, I'm calling it a Bloomberg Lab Day. I'm not going to give you more lectures, give you time to work. So you can use it, you have to work on your group projects, you can use it to get this multiple data. Uh, you, you won't be able to use it for the Boeing assignment, that's due Monday, 10 a.m., but there won't be any lecture on Monday. Wednesday, I'll see you one week from today for presentations. Okay? Other than that, make sure you sign the sign-in sheet, and I'll give you a few minutes back to enjoy this beautiful day.